became a career firefighter with the Howard County Department of Fire and Rescue Service, the chief of the medical division or EMS, the unofficial historian of the Howard County Department of Fire and Rescue Service, over 65,000 digital images and newspaper articles, magazine articles, etc. Middle of the night may bring together both career and volunteer firefighters. It is the remembrance of the most traumatic of situations that bind them together. The sights, sounds, and emotions of a call sometimes never go away. Being handed a, a small child, a two or three-year-old child that had been run over by a vehicle, uh, and uh, uh, performing CPR on the child when it was grossly obvious that the, the child uh, uh, was not uh, uh, was not going to be saved. And, and this is back in the swoop and scoop days. And, uh, uh, when Howard County General Hospital was not there, and I just remember uh, going to the closest hospital, St. Agnes at that time, uh, by myself, uh, in the back of the ambulance. And uh, the 15, 20 minutes it took to get there was uh, an eternity. My topic today, uh, I just entitled it a, an evening cookout, or so I thought. This is sort of involved. We in emergency services, all of us in emergency services, throughout our careers, uh, will handle calls that, that we remember and handle calls that uh, may very well impact us. And every police officer, every firefighter, EMS individual will, will handle those calls. Most of those calls that we handle, we're able to rationalize and learn from, move on, and basically it goes out of our minds. In fact, we can't even recall. I, people come up to me this very day and thank me for calls that I helped them with in years past, and I can't remember them, which is okay, I guess. But there are also some calls that stick with you forever, and there are calls that you, you cannot get out of your mind. And again, uh, my stories are not unique in that uh, probably every firefighter, police officer, paramedic you talk to, they have their own stories. But there are four incidents that, that to this very day that that I recall, I can recall just as if they were yesterday, and I can recall them in detail. Now, the common thread that I've, I've finally decided was that uh, three of the calls involved small children, and the fourth call involved a a 20-year-old girl that I'd gone to high school with. And for different reasons, each of those calls certainly impacted me. And I'll be discussing, as I said, one of those calls today, and when I work up the nerve, I'll probably discuss the other calls in the future. And as I said, I entitled this particular incident, uh, which happened in summer of 1969, I just entitled an evening cookout, or so I thought. And also, subtitled with that is Lessons Learned. I learned two lessons from this particular incident. Anyway, it was late summer. I had been invited to a cookout to one of my friend's house in an upscale part of Howard County. And it was actually a huge family cookout, not for my family, but for uh, the individual's family. And there were probably going to be 50, 60 people there or whatever. But anyway, and what I learned, one of the lessons I also learned is some days things just don't go as you thought they were. Some things just don't go as, uh, as planned. Anyway, I'd gotten dressed up in my party clothes and ready for the cookout. And I had about an hour before I had to go to the cookout. So... If any of you that knew me back in 1969, if that was an hour, that was enough time for me to go down to the firehouse. So I did. Went down to the firehouse, and uh, just as I was getting ready to leave to go to the cookout, they put out a call for a child struck by a car. Well, calls that involve children, you never turn down. So I said, well, I, I'll eventually get to this cookout after I handle this call. Bottom line is that uh, myself and Hank Long, who was the driver that evening, we took off. It was going to be about a 10 minute response. And uh, both he and I were reviewing the things that we needed to do once we arrived on the scene, reviewing our protocols, doing our mental checklist of the skills we needed to perform, et cetera. But I also learned long ago that, that uh, there's really no sense in speculating uh, how bad the call may be because it could range from the benign uh, to the absolute worst. While we were en route, we were updated with new information now that uh, reporting that a child had been run over by a vehicle. Now that definitely increased up the anti-force and we knew now this is not gonna be a benign call, but uh, could be a very bad call. As I said, it was a relatively long response, about 10 minutes. And again, I'm running down my list of priorities of what I want to do once I get there. 
what would be my priorities? What will be the things that I could ignore? No sooner I got those thoughts out of my mind, communications came back and said, we advise that you all can cancel. Parents are taking their child to the hospital in their own vehicle. Now, that was essentially good news for us. I realized that I wouldn't have to deal with this child stuck by a car. How bad could the injuries be if the parents were going to take the child to the hospital themselves? I glanced at my watch and looked at my watch and knew that the cookout awaited. I'd be able to get back to the station and to the party on time. What a relief of emotions. With this type of activity, being in emergency services, it's like a roller coaster ride. Ups and downs, lefts and rights. Real fast, real slow. And I've been warned about that, that that would happen on occasions. But I just had not experienced it myself. We turned the lights off, turned around, headed back to the station. And uh, I even asked him, remember, asking the driver, Hank, did he have any plans for this evening? But before he could answer that, communications came back and advised, be advised, Howard County Police have the vehicle stopped on Centennial Lane near Frederick Road. They're asking you all to expedite. Well, that's a term you never want to hear, being requested to expedite. So knew now that this is going to be not a good situation. We reversed our direction again. Our ETA was going to be about uh, two to three minutes. As we went up Frederick Road and turned down Centennial Lane, we could see several police cars in the road about 10 houses down. And my following recollections are, and I sort of bulleted those in my mind, and actually I'll share with you now that I found it very therapeutic for me to document, to write down all my thoughts about the, this particular incident several years ago in detail. I'd never done that before. And I, I found that this was very helpful to me. And I'm sort of reading the notes uh, from that particular narrative. I remember we stopped the ambulance and I could see a police officer running down the driveway. Turned out to be Herman Charity. Herman and I went to high school together. He was a star football player. And now here he is running down the driveway. And I, like I said, I immediately recognized him because we'd gone to high school together. Looking at his face though, I could tell there was extreme urgency in his eyes and in his stride. It's remarkable that these two high school buddies are now being united once again in handling this tragedy. The next thing I remember is looking at what he was carrying in his arms. It was a small child, two years old, plus or minus. The child was limp. There was an adult airway that was jammed down the child's mouth. Now, that's not right. You don't want to put an adult airway down in a, a child's uh, uh, air, mouth, but that's what I observed. As he near me, I could uh, see the child and had the child had distinct track marks uh, over his body, starting from the right shoulder, going across his chest and down his abdomen to his left pelvis. I remember looking at the officer as he was carrying the child. It's almost like he was carrying a football, like he did in high school, cradling it in his arms, and now he's going to hand it off to me. I recall that, as I said, the police officer been a star athlete at the high school, and how ironic, uh, now he's handing off the child to me, expecting me to, to score and to make a difference. The child was shoved into my hands. I now noticed the child was cyanotic, blue, had a significant amount of blood uh, was flowing from his mouth. His eyes were open and staring right through me. I remember a lot of commotion up the driveway and hearing some unearthly screams from the parents, neighbors, I, I figured out. Hank quickly escorted me to the ambulance door, opened it. I stepped in and he closed the door behind me. Now, this was in the day before uh, paramedic units. This is in the day before trauma units. This is in the day before helicopters. So uh, it is now up to me to make a difference. As I lay the child on the stretcher, we are off towards St. Agnes Hospital, which is a good 20, 25 minutes away. Now here I am in the back of the ambulance by myself with this small, frail, bloody and broken child laying on this adult stretcher. And it looked so small to me. God, I didn't want to be there, anywhere but here. But that was not to be, certainly not on this day. Time to do what I can. I removed the airway from the child that had been jammed in its mouth. I assessed for a pulse and breathing, neither were present time for me to start CPR. I was confident I knew the compression rate, depth of compression for an infant or child, no worries. I grabbed a bag valve mask and started to ventilate. I was comfortable with my skills level and ability to perform. But when I went to ventilate, I was unable to because blood was continuously flowing from the child's mouth and ears. I cleared the airway best I could, but it was not enough. What was removed was immediately replaced. I was not concerned at this moment in time about the chest trauma or neck injury, cardiac arrest, 
trumped all other injuries. Back to chest compressions. Warm blood continued to flow onto me, onto the sheet, onto the stretcher frame, onto the floor, and flowing out the back door. So much to do all at the same time, but I only have two hands and I'm just one person. The wail of the siren was continuous, but I really didn't pay any attention to that. Even though Hank was driving professionally, I was still getting thrown around a bit in the back of the patient uh, ambulance compartment. I fell to the floor a couple times, so much for my clean cookout clothes. And the blood continued to flow incessantly from the mouth and the ears. It crossed my mind that there has, been, there has to be a hose hooked up to the child somewhere that was pumping more blood into the child so that it would come out of the child's mouth and nose. Now, I remember my CPR training, which was first aid back in then, CPR and advanced first aid. I remember my training, never stop CPR unless a patient is revived. Well, that was not going to be. You're relieved by someone of equal or higher training. Well, that was not going to be. Or a physician advises you to stop, and that was not going to happen for 20 minutes. Or you're just too damn tired to continue. None of those apply to me at that moment. What to do? what to do. I'm 19 years old. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here in the back of the ambulance alone. I don't want to be the sole person responsible for this child's life. But I'm here. I'm alone. And it's up to me to let this child live or die. Why has God allowed this to happen? And still the child's life but continued out the door. No one ever told me to be like this. The seconds seemed like minutes, the minutes like hours. Surely we're almost at the hospital, I asked Hank. No, we have another 10 minutes or so to go. Traffic is heavy. I'm alone in the back of the ambulance. There's absolutely nothing I can do to save this child. Nothing I can do is going to make a difference. At that very moment, I had a personal revelation. I can't continue. It's absolutely useless. God, why me? At that moment, I just sat back on the squad bench against the wall for the remaining ride to the hospital, just staring uh, blankly at the little tyke, whose life was over before it ever began. Eyes were staring blankly towards the ceiling of the ambulance, and that hose still connected to the child. The blood was still flowing on the stretcher and out the back door. No one ever told me to be like this. It was a lesson that I had to learn by myself. It dawned on me that no parent had accompanied this little child, no parent uh, with the child as its life slowly slipped away. I took some personal comfort in the fact that I was there with a child and its passing would not be alone. Don't let anyone ever say that time doesn't stand still. It did for me that day. It was an absolute eternity uh, for me to be in the back of the ambulance by myself with a little one and me just sitting there leaning back against the wall, just staring at the child. Hank announced that we were finally at, at St. Agnes Hospital. And as we did, I started CPR again, just for show. It was a sad time in the ER. The doctors and uh, nurses quickly pronounced the child deceased. The staff was understandably impacted. I was a bloody mess. And my affect was probably somewhat zombie light. I think someone asked, was I okay? I shrugged it off, I said I was fine. And I went on about my business. The Howard County police officer, the high school grad that I was with, arrived at the hospital before I left. Uh, I asked what happened, and it was the classic, the classic situation. A parent was backing down the driveway in a car. Their child came out to say goodbye and ran into the path of the vehicle and was struck. He advised that the parents were devastated and inconsolable, as one would expect. We left the hospital out of service and back to the station. Uh, the ride back for Hank and I to the station was rather quiet. It took a while to get the unit cleaned up and finally placed back in service, and it was now ready for the next inevitable call. Uh, it was now time for me to leave to go have some fun at the cookout. I did go back to the house. I changed clothes. I, I believe I, I put my clothes in the washing machine. I don't think my parents were there. Uh, I certainly didn't want them to see me in that condition. I didn't want them to worry, so I was going to try to cover up the evidence and as I said, I put my clothing in, in the dishwasher, dishwasher, washing machine, changed, and I left. Many incidents we go on don't stop just because we leave the station. Those of us in emergency services, operations, and similar occupations certainly understand that many calls uh, leave the gift that just keeps on giving. 
You may be away from the physical environment of the fire station, but you're never that far away from the images, the images, the memories, and the senses. As I said, I'd gone back to the house, took a shower, took my clothes off, uh, put new ones on, and I, I left and, and went to the, towards the party. I, I do know if my parents had been home that day and they'd asked me, you know, what happened, if they'd asked, I wouldn't have said much. And they had learned long ago that I would talk about an incident if and when the mood struck me. Probably for that reason and two reasons. I didn't, and the reason I would do that or not talk about it, I didn't want to rehash or relive the whole adventure so soon and once again. And or two, I didn't want them to worry about me or even worse, encourage me to, to leave the fire service. I hopped in the car, drove slowly and indirectly uh, to the festivities, to the cookout. I remember that when I got there, I was chastised about being late. They didn't want to hear about, I was on an ambulance call. They certainly didn't want to hear about the incident. There's no sense me telling them what had happened. They would not understand, nor would they want their good times to be ruined with a depressing story. The food was the typical warm weather cookout. Again, I was not, I was chastised for not wanting to eat anything or not being hungry, you know, go figure. I did not join in with the festivities or the insane chatter the family gathering was having. I was looked upon as being aloof. Then after the meal was over with and digested, uh, they moved on to apparently what was the big family tradition uh, with them, the talent show. Each person that was there was to get up, stand in the middle of the you know, 50 people and do some sort of activity, uh, tell jokes, sing, dance, juggle, whatever. It was just a fun time being had by all. I'm pretty sure I didn't perform anything and continue to be scorned by everyone else around the campfire for not being interested and joining the festivities. It was during that pleasant gathering that I realized, and I had an epiphany of sorts, that I was not like everybody else. I was not like normal folks. I was different. I, on the other hand, was in a totally different frame of mind, far away from these folks. Uh, I knew at that moment on that I could never discuss or interact with normal people about my real life uh, adventures, how it really impacted me, what it was really like to be in emergency services. There's just no way that one can interject in a conversation uh, with normal people the type of dialogue and experiences that, that you had. And that pretty much held true for almost 50 years until I decided I could share my adventures uncensored with normal folks like you. And I did that in, in writing. What a day that had been. What hard lessons I learned and learned by myself. Both things learned from a performance base as well as what I learned about emotions and psyche. Most of all, I learned about myself. I can persevere. I can handle the tough assignments. I can work alone if needed. And I learned that I'm quite different from the majority of my friends I had at that point. I also knew what the power of my fire service family was to be in the rest of my life. Yep, today was to have been all about an evening cookout. Life does have its little twists and turns, does it not? Please use your remaining heartbeats wisely and not waste a single precious one.